either enhance its uh, activity or to change its specificity in a, in a way that, that made it a better catalyst, uh, could then uh, work as a ribonucleoprotein enzyme. But an important step would occur when RNA encoded protein synthesis had evolved. At that point, RNA molecules that could encode a protein, which could come back and bind to them um, and enhance their activity or, or give them activity in a new sort of reaction, would uh, be selected. And so you can see that at this point, uh, the sort of relative importance of the RNA is shrinking and the protein is becoming more important in catalysis. And finally, we come to the modern uh, day where enzymes are mostly, except with the exception of, of those that are ribozymes, most enzymes in current cells are certainly proteins, but they ca often carry along with them one of these nucleotide coenzymes, which perhaps is a molecular fossil, uh, giving us reason to believe that all of them originally came from an RNA ancestor. I think a fascinating possibility, but of course one that's very hard to go into the laboratory and test. Now it turned out that there was a, a possible spin-off of the discovery that RNA could be a catalyst in a very different direction uh, other than the origins of life. And this has to do with the uh, medical or pharmaceutical arena, and that's what I'd like to address next. I'd like to go back to a slide that I already showed you uh, that RNA catalysts have the ability to recognize other RNA molecules shown in pink and that once this complex is formed, the ribozyme can catalyze the cutting of the pink RNA chain without itself being damaged so that one ribozyme can cycle through uh, this process an indefinite number of times. Now, why would this be of any possible medical interest? So, does any of you know, I'll ask the audience, do you know of a pink RNA chain that uh, someone interested in, in uh, curing disease might be interested in inactivating? Back there. Oh, the yes. Excuse me? The virus. A virus was the answer, and that's certainly a good answer. Do you know of any viruses that are themselves made out of RNA, where the RNA is actually the heart of the virus? AIDS is a retrovirus. So AIDS is one example. The HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, is a, a, a coated or an enveloped uh, piece of RNA, actually two pieces of RNA per virion. So that's one example. Did you have another example here? Turns out if you guys take a wild guess, you're probably going to be right because many of the inf viral infections that plague us, including uh, flu, including the common cold, polio, uh, these are all RNA viruses. And even in those cases where the genetic material inside the virus is DNA instead of RNA, those viruses have to produce that they go through this same uh, pathway, DNA makes RNA makes protein, so they produce specific viral RNAs at the subsequent step. So independent of whether you have an, a DNA virus or an RNA virus, there would be a RNA target with it, which is specific to the virus and not found in healthy human cells, which one would like to uh, destroy. And it turns out that cutting the RNA chain, it's then very quickly um, degraded inside of cells. So, so disrupting the continuity of the RNA chain in most cases is sufficient to completely inactivate its activity. Now, there are another set of diseases in which uh, a virus is, is not involved. This could be a bacterial or a fungal infection, or it could be something like cancer, where normal cellular genetic processes have gone awry. But even in those cases, almost always, there are specific RNAs which are being produced 
in a mutated form or which are being produced in an inappropriate amount or at an inappropriate time for a particular cell and causing the rampant proliferation of cells that we know as cancer. So the interest in cutting and thereby knocking out specific RNAs is not restricted to the viral diseases. Let's see how this might work. Um, you can design one of these small ribozymes called a hammerhead ribozyme to recognize and pair with uh, virtually any target RNA that you might wish to destroy. Why is this called a hammerhead? And please don't blame me for the name. This was uh, a very imaginative name uh, that was invented by an Australian uh, by the name of Bob Simons who worked on, on this system uh, first. And uh, it's called a hammerhead because you can envision this to look sort of like uh, a carpenter's hammer. This is the handle of the hammer. This would be the head of the hammer and sort of the claw of the hammer back here. So it's sort of standing uh, upside down. Uh, we were all disappointed when we heard this was supposed to be a carpenter's hammer. Since Simons was from Australia, we had been thinking of the hammerhead sharks on the Great Barrier Reef, and this seemed uh, much less exciting to have this RNA named after a simple carpenter's hammer. In any case, uh, if you have a, a target RNA or substrate RNA, which you wish to design a hammerhead to, to uh, interact with, we simply use the rules of Watson-Crick complementary base pairing to uh, choose a sequence on these arms in the position shown as an N prime to pair with the sequence on, that is adjacent to a, a G followed by a U, which of course would occur very commonly in RNA about once every 16 nucleotides, uh, and so that this complex can form in a specific way. So you could all be ribozyme engineers very um, easily. So for example, if there's a, a, an A present in the substrate, what do you put across from it in the ribozyme? A U. Some of you said T. Well, if it was DNA, it'd be T. But for RNA, U is the equivalent of T. If there's a G in the target RNA, you put a C opposite it. If there's a C in the target, you put a G opposite it. And so uh, very simple and very unusual in uh, the pharmaceutical industry to be able to design a drug for one disease and then in a few minutes with pencil and paper retool that drug to be targeted against a different disease by simply knowing which RNA one would have to knock out in order to alleviate the disease symptoms. So once this complementary base pairing uh, results in the assembly of the complex between the ribozyme and its target, then the nucleotides shown in the boxed region wrap up around this site, and in the presence of, again, a metal ion, the uh, chain is broken. Now, let's go back to the idea of an HIV or retroviral infection as being one possible, um, uh, one possible target for this sort of technology. And this is, in fact, one that is being very heavily pursued in quite a number of academic and biotechnology laboratories. So the retrovirus, which contains the two strands of RNA uh, covered with protein and, and an envelope that includes uh, uh, lipid material as well, attaches to a, a lymphocyte, a, a blood cell, and the uh, RNA is uh, released inside of the cell. At this point, if one had a ribozyme directed to specifically recognize that blue retroviral RNA, uh, th they can form a complex, and then you can see the little scissors is supposed to evoke the idea that that RNA, blue RNA, will then be cut. Uh, once the RNA is converted or reverse transcribed into a DNA copy, which is then integrated into a human chromosome, it would, of course, be uh, unavailable for ribozyme cleavage. But then in order for the in infectious cycle to continue, the DNA needs to be copied or transcribed into two, uh, 